Hi there and welcome to video number four of Unit 7, Imperialism, Progressivism, and World Wars from 1890 to 1945. All right, so today we're going to be getting into our second topic for World War I, which is World War I, the home front. And you'll notice here I accidentally wrote World War II, but I meant to say it was World War I, the home front, which is 7.6. So let's go ahead and get into this. So <clears throat> let's start with how mobilization for World War I actually affected Americans that were living on the home front. So a uh, couple things to consider. So first of all, um, the United States needed to mobilize vast economic resources and it needed to happen really quickly to prevent German victory. You may remember by the time the United States entered the war, Russia was on the cusp of pulling out of the war. So to prevent any more German gains, it really needed to happen quickly. So to that end, there's going to be a bunch of different uh, boards and administrations that are set up to help mobilize quickly. The War Industries Board, for example, set production priorities and uh, established a central control over raw materials and prices. This is very unusual outside of wartime, right? Uh, the, the government regulation of the economy was not something you would see normally outside of a major war effort. Um, Herbert Hoover, who will later become president, took charge of the Food Administration. The Food Administration was intended to encourage Americans to eat less meat and bread, so that meat and bread could be shipped to the troops. And that actually tripled U.S. overseas shipments during World War I. The Fuel Administration was uh, intended to save coal um, closing by closing non-essential factories, putting uh, into effect daylight saving time, so to reduce the amount of energy Americans were using. So again, that could be used for the war effort. The Railroad Administration, once again, taking central public control over the railroads. That was to coordinate traffic, to standardize railroad equipment, to make sure there was no kinks in the supply chain for World War I. And then the National War Labor Board. And this is really important to understand. The National War Labor Board is really going to step in to deal with labor disputes. So up to this point, right, it was just what the labor unions could gain from industrial capitalism. And often, you know, the, the businessmen, the capitalists had really good ways to break strikes, uh, to prevent labor from interest from gaining too much uh, power or too many concessions. Well, World War I was a huge gain for labor demands because the National War Labor Board basically said, look, we don't have time to deal with shutdown strikes, you know, interruptions to the supply chain. This needs to get fixed. So by coming in as a third party and regulating kind of impartially these labor disputes just to make sure things are still produced regularly, um, labor is going to win a lot of concessions like higher wages. We see the establishment of an eight hour workday. We're also going to see an increase in union membership. Um, and then finally, uh, Wilson's war government, Woodrow Wilson was the president during World War One. They raised thirty three billion dollars in two years through loans and taxes. Uh, they also conducted four massive drives to convince Americans to put their savings into federal government liberty bonds. If you don't know what a federal bond is, essentially it's like an IOU by the government. You take your savings, you give it to the government, you get a slip of paper that says, hey, we owe you this much money plus interest. So Americans took their savings that was sitting in the banks, put it into liberty bonds, and then that money could then be used for the war effort. Okay, so public opinion during the war was really important. Patriotic persuasion was something that was a really common tactic, also legal intimidation. Um, this was used to ensure there was public support for the war. Remember, unlike World War II, which was pretty universally, close to universally supported in the United States, World War I, there was a lot of mixed opinions. You may recall in the previous video, we talked about the fact that progressive socialists, um, you know, labor even often kind of opposed war efforts opposed the idea of getting involved in what many viewed as a as an imperialist war. So the Committee on Public Information was formed, which was a propaganda agency, and it was enlisted, enlisted the service of artists, writers, vaudeville performers, movie stars, and they were all intended to <clears throat> depict the U.S. soldiers as heroic and the Kaiser, who was Germany's monarch, as villainous and terrible. Um, films, posters, pamphlets were all created to urge Americans to watch out for German spies uh, and just generally just put out propaganda that really emphasized um, supporting the war effort as a patriotic duty.
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about civil liberties then. Okay, so we're going to see a, some changes to civil liberties during wartime, not surprisingly. So this war hysteria that we start to see and patriotism really gave an excuse for nativist groups. And you may recall nativists we talked about in Unit 6, uh, nativist groups to really express their prejudices by charging minorities with disloyalty. So the American Protective League will form. They mounted a hate the Hun campaign. The Huns were what they called the Germans uh, to attack all things German, uh, including German Americans. There were many German immigrants, first or second generation German immigrants living in or third generation German Americans living in the United States. Um, so they were not infrequently attacked during World War I. The manufacturers of war materials could actually refuse to hire or could fire German American citizens um, with the excuse that they could endanger, they could be spies for Germany and could endanger the war supply line. Um, also, right, the uh, Immigration Act of 1917, also called the Bar Zone Act, uh, prohibited anyone residing in a region from the Middle East to Southeast Asia from entering the United States. So basically, it completely um, destroyed immigration from those regions. Um, and it also really cut down on immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe uh, by passing a literacy test to prevent that kind of immigration. So really, we're gonna see a really big reduction in immigration during and after World War I is we're gonna see more um, uh, quotia laws and immigrant anti-immigrant laws passed during this time period, which is really gonna to lead to a really long, decades long low point in immigration to the United States. Uh, in the 20th century. We also see restrictions on free speech. Uh, the Espionage Act in 19, 1917 um, threatened imprisonment for up to 20 years for people who tried to incite rebellion of armed forces or obstruct the draft, which we'll talk about in a second. The Sedition Act in 1918 was used to prohibit anyone from making disloyal or critical remarks about the U.S. government. Um, 2,000 people were prosecuted under these laws. Uh, many of them were socialists um, or had uh, or foreign born, um, including socialist leader Eugene Debs, we talked about in Unit 6 as a major union leader and socialist. Um, in 1919, we see Schenck versus the United States, which is a Supreme Court case that upheld the constitutionality of the Espionage Act. Um, and this was had been challenged because a man had been imprisoned for distributing pamphlets against the draft, um, essentially being critical of the government. He had been charged under the Espionage Act. And um, this was he argued that this was a violation of his free speech. Um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is going to chief justice is going to claim that the right to free speech could be limited if it presented a quote unquote clear and present danger to public safety. Now, whether or not a man distributing pamphlets against the draft was a clear and present danger. I mean, you can decide whether or not you agree with that, but um, certainly it did set a precedent a precedent for um, future times of emergency to limit free speech. Okay, so the armed forces, right? Uh, the Selective Service Act in 1917 creates a selective service system that it was uh, intended to conscript men into the military or draft them. Uh, essentially, it required all men between the ages of 21 and 30, and later on that's going to be extended to 18 to 45, to register for possible induction into the military. And the men were called up by lottery, essentially, the, usually by birth date. Um, African Americans definitely served in uh, World War I. They continue to serve, however, in racially segregated units. Um, very few were permitted to be officers. All of them were banned from the Marine Corps. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois hoped that the record of service of African Americans would earn them equal rights at home, but he was definitely disappointed on this front. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of these effects we're seeing on the American society from mobilization. So the wartime economy definitely adjusted realities for everyone, including women and uh, men, business and labor, immigrants, native born. Um, so there was a lot of rural to urban migration during this time period of people seeking out wartime economic opportunities, jobs and factories for wartime production. Many, many, many women worked in production of war goods. Now we think of when like World War II and Rosie the Riveter and women working in wartime production then, but they were doing it in World War I as well um, <clears throat> in a variety of ways in factories, but also working on farms. Um, their contributions were part of what really finally convinced Wilson, uh, President Wilson in the Congress to support the 19th Amendment, which uh, gave women the right to vote federally. 
Uh, we're also going to see upheavals in Mexico. You may recall, uh, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about American imperialism in the Spanish-American War. But in between 1910 and 1920, Mexico is experiencing a kind of vast civil war. And um, those sort of uh, political upheavals uh, combined with these economic opportunities, the United States caused thousands of Mexicans to cross the border for work in agriculture and mining, as well as in Midwestern factories, although that is going to slow down to a trickle after World War I. Um, other effects on American society, the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration was the largest movement of people uh, during World War I, and the Great Migration was essentially African Americans from the South more migrating to northern cities. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for this, but a big one is the race relations continued to deteriorate in the South. Segregation was alive and well. Uh, considerable uh, racial violence against African Americans are going to be uh, push factors. So is the destruction of cotton crops by the boll weevil. Uh, so it became harder and harder for sharecroppers to really make a living. And there was just limited economic factors. These all in the South, these all were push factors pushing African Americans out of the Southern areas. So we see a real um, kind of diaspora of African Americans spreading out into Northern cities like Chicago. Um, most people, most African Americans migrated between 1910 and 1930. They finally start to slow down because of the economic collapse um, of the 1930s. Uh, and then migration will resume again during World War II, this internal migration. Four million more are going to migrate between 1940 and 1970 into cities. Uh, a lot of people did improve their economic conditions, but the newcomers to Northern Sisters all, cities also faced racial tension and discrimination. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so let's talk about the post-war challenges that we saw in the U.S. after World War I. So after World War I was over or as it was ending, what are some of the challenges that are left that people were facing? So um, at the end of World War I, we saw the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. Uh, the Spanish flu pandemic was incredibly devastating and spread worldwide. Uh, for the first time in history, this world war is causing men from all different nations to be in contact with each other. Um, so a huge amount of, of contact between people of different nations and continents, so much more travel than it ever occurred before. And then towards the end of the war, as soldiers began to go home um, after the war was beginning to end, you started to see them take that flew home with them. So this contact, increased contact that you see between peoples of different nations of World War I because of soldiers uh, really led to this worldwide explosion of the Spanish flu. So in the U.S., the first place you're going to find this is going to be in these really crowded military camps. And 20 to 40 year olds have the highest mortality rates for the Spanish flu. Uh, somewhere between 500,000 and 675,000 Americans died and 50 million people died worldwide, which is about, about you know, um, about 10 times as many people actually died or five times as many people who actually died in the war. So the Spanish influenza, influenza pandemic was much, much, much more deadly to, um, to people than World War I actually was. Don't get me wrong, World War I was very deadly, but the Spanish flu um, definitely increased tenfold this, uh, the deaths. Um, so the pandemic was of, in the United States was mostly underreported, right? We were right at the end of the war at this point. There was very limited media coverage. The government made an effort to kind of, um, to kind of uh, prevent too much reporting on this because they wanted to keep up wartime morale and they didn't want, um, you know, people leaving their duties or their posts to go and care for others who had the Spanish flu. Um, so we're going to start to see demobilization, obviously, at the end of the 19th century, <clears throat> which leaves us with a lot of questions. I mean, soldiers are going to come home and they're going to take jobs back. Uh, African Americans and women had begun to work these jobs uh, in factories, and those are going to be taken away from them again after men begun to come back from World War One. Um, and then also after World War One, European farms and uh, products are bouncing back. And this is going to be a real challenge for farmers in the United States, because during World War One, the U.S. was a primary supplier of food goods to Europe as well. Uh, as European farms bounce back, that means there's going to be a big expansion of supply. Prices are going to be gutted. And this is going to be a real challenge for a lot of the farmers who had taken out loans during the war in order to increase production of crops. Um, and we're going to talk more about that when we get into um, our lead up to the Great Depression.
Um, other challenges, the Red Scare, the first Red Scare, you may not have realized there were actually two of them. OK, we tend to think of the one in the 1950s with Joseph McCarthy. Well, um, in the 1919 and the early 1920s, we see the first Red Scare. Um, a lot of unhappiness over the peace process. You may recall in the last video, we talked about the fact that there was a lot of um, uh, tension over whether or not the United States should sign the Treaty of Versailles and join the League of Nations. So unhappiness with this process, fears of communism. Uh, again, you may recall that in 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution led to a communist takeover of Russia, which then became the Soviet Union. Um, and then worries about labor unrest all sort of combined to create this anti-communist hysteria. Um, this also fueled xenophobia, um, kind of fear of foreigners or outsiders, which resulted in further restrictions on immigration in beginning of the 1920s. Um, you can kind of really see this uh, connection that was often made in people's mind between communism and labor. OK, um, a series of labor strikes by the end of World War One um, or right after World War One is really going to turn people against labor. You can see um, the first step this uh, political cartoon is called, and you can see labor is the first step, but then it says strikes and walkouts is the first thing, then disorder and riots, then Bolshevism, right? Like the Bolsheviks, the communist Bolsheviks, murders, chaos, and then what is kind of the question. So um, a series of unexplained bombings caused uh, the attorney general, uh, Mitchell Palmer, to launch the Palmer Rage, which is mass arrests of anarchists, socialists, labor agitators, many of whom had nothing to do with any sort of violence. Uh, so between November 1919 and January of 1926, 6,000 people were arrested with very limited criminal evidence. And most of these were foreign born. Uh, 500 people were deported as a result of the Palmer raids. So overall, anti-labor -union, anti union attitudes had softened during the progressive era. So, so the very early 20th century that we talked about in a previous video, so 1900 to 1910, 1915, anti-union attitudes had softened, and then labor had really made important gains during World War I, as we just discussed. But these series of strikes we see in 1919 really turned public opinion against the unions. Um, the government ended up sending in National Guard and state troops to break strikes against the U.S. Steel in 1919, which resulted in the death of 18 workers. So increasingly, labor seems to be linked in people's mind with communism um, at the end of World War I. OK, other challenges, um, in, uh, especially in terms of race relations. After 1900, we see increasing racial tension over Jim Crow oppression in the South, really rapid growth of the Ku Klux Klan, and this continued lynching of African-Americans in the South. Uh, and there's problems in the North, too. The migration of African-Americans to the North caused a lot of resentment by whites who dislike, dislike the increased competition for jobs and for housing. We see a series of race riots that erupt during and after the war, uh, including one in Chicago in which 40 people were killed when an argument over who could use a beach escalated. But absolutely the worst incident of racial violence, and I, and I hesitate to call this a race riot, um, but the, one of the worst incidents of racial violence occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, which many may have heard of. Um, this is, comes to be called the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, and it began after uh, members of uh, the African-American community in Tulsa, many of whom who lived in the Greenwood District, which is a thriving African-American community, um, thwarted the lynching of a black man who was kind of arrested on pretty trumped up charges. Uh, they knew that uh, African-American community kind of was faced with the reality that you know, his lynching was likely that it was up to them to sort of try to protect him outside the courthouse. Um, but this led to a lot of retribution. White mobs came to the Greenwood district um, that was known for its prosperity um, as this thriving business district. It was called the Black Wall Street. And white mobs destroyed uh, well over a thousand black owned homes and businesses in the neighborhood, virtually leveling the district. Um, and uh, probably at least 50 to 300 people were killed in this massacre, although it's really impossible to know exactly how many. Um, and nobody was ever held accountable for this. There was at no point um, has any government authority, whether it was municipal, local, uh, county, you know, regional, state, federal, nobody ever held anyone responsible for this massacre. And in fact, um, a lot of the quote unquote deputies that were hired by the municipality were actually contributed to the violence, who were participating themselves, um, were giving arms and weapons out to white men. Um, to participate in this uh, massacre. So there was no one ever really held accountable for this. 
Um, another part of the resurgence we see um, of Southern white pride and racial tension in the uh, 19 uh, teens and 20s was this increase in monuments. Uh, between 1900 and the 1920s, we see a whole bunch of new monuments that were built to honor Jefferson Davis and other Confederate generals. And monuments like these really tell us a lot more about the time period they're made than what they're supposed to commemorate. Um, a lot of human rights reformers believe that unlike the early memorials in cemeteries that were built, you know, in the 1860s and 70s, um, these memorials built in the 20th century were intended to glorify the quote unquote lost cause interpretation of the Confederacy, which includes the defending of white supremacy and slavery. So a lot of controversy over these memorials um, exists and you probably have heard about that. So. Overall, the sacrifice and the casualties of World War I really drained progressive idealism. Um, the majority of people didn't want to fix things anymore. They just wanted to return to sort of a less complicated period of quote unquote normalcy. Um, normalcy, rather. Um, the 1920s saw increased prosperity eventually. Uh, automobiles, jazz, movies, sports. But the kind of uh, gray underside of this, we also see a lot of attempts to restrict immigration, a denial of science, and a return to isolationism. And these are all things that we are going to deal with in our next couple of videos when we talk about the 1920s. So I'll see you then.